Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity this year to move a genuine change and revolution forward, and we can finish the job in 1996. I believe that Steve Forbes is the ablest man of his generation that I have met. He's a man of character, he's a man of strength, he's a man of discipline. Steve Forbes is a tireless worker, somebody who is truly committed to whatever responsibility he undertakes. Not only are we going to improve our standard of living, but also we're going to improve something that has gone downhill for the last 30 years, and that is the quality of life in this country. He loves the country. He feels as though the country has been very good to him. In, in the very best old sense of the word, he is a patriot. He has the gift of vision. And he also has the gift of leadership. And I think that's why he's running for president. They used to say in the 1960s, in a different context, power to the people, but in 1995 and 1996, we are going to return power to the true people of this country right. around the nation. How do you do, Steve Forbes? How do you do, Steve Forbes? Uh, plans you have for Medicare, Social Security. And we don't want any more taxes. Hang in there. We will. Thank you. Today we need to remind ourselves we must have growth and opportunity for not some Americans, but for all Americans. It's so refreshing to hear you on television. And when I saw your commercial, I said, yes, he's got my vote. And thank you. Thank you. You've made my day. Good, Good luck. luck with your campaign. It'll be an interesting one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Campaigning is enjoyable, stimulating, and challenging. I don't begrudge at all what Lincoln called the baths of public opinion. That's what the nation's about in public life. The 96 campaign, I do believe, is one of the most critical in American history, certainly in this century. I, I remember stories from when I was a kid uh, uh, of, of Steve uh, wowing uh, the adults with his knowledge of uh, American political history and uh, detailed, uh, specific knowledge of certain campaigns. One of the most vivid memories outside of uh, what was happening in school and homework and all that kind of stuff was uh, my father being involved in politics. Seeing him on the campaign trail, knocking on doors, there was always activity. And to a kid, activity is exciting. I think we all know that if Washington insiders had the answers, they would have implemented them by now. That is why I state straightforwardly that we must start with a flat tax that is also a tax cut. We, we played a lot of board games as kids. One that I remember particularly well was a game called Politics. It was a dice game, but you did learn at a young age the number of electoral votes in each state. and. Uh, you did learn the 50 or then 48 states. Summers were pretty well defined by when we went out west. And we'd all go together in the wagon out to, to Wyoming, which probably took a three or four day drive. It was fascinating because you got to see the country in a way that you wouldn't before. Our parents instilled in us some very, very strong values. And that was uh, on the idea of hard work. There was no substitute for that. The idea of being close as a family, that uh, you stuck together. There's a sense of, um, I guess, an underlying moral tone, a sense of morality, what was right and what was not right. When I went to college, I went to uh, Princeton University, which wasn't too far from home. Majored in uh, American history, it was a turbulent time. All colleges seemed to be turned upside down in 1968. At a time when uh, most of his peers were doing uh, their counterculture thing, uh, protesting the war in Vietnam and so on, Steve was starting a magazine for students called Business Today. The timing of it was not very good, but we did distribute it to 200,000 students around the country, and it still survives today. Special interest groups do have a pull on the elected officials. What would you do as far as campaign finance reform? Well, I think with campaign finance reform, you have to recognize that in the past, those have simply been incumbent protection acts to make it hard for challenges. I always knew what I wanted to do, and uh, when I got a good job offer at Forbes magazine, I thought I 
should say yes. Almost as soon as he graduated from Princeton, he joined the editorial staff and worked his way up, and I think earned the respect of most of his colleagues here. As he worked as a reporter and a researcher and came up through the ranks as an editor, he proved his worth to the running of the magazine. Forbes, we did not have beats, so you had to learn about a lot of industries, a lot of companies, a lot of trends here and overseas that would affect business, and you learned it fairly quickly how volatile, how fast-changing the world is. The time was 85. Gorbachev had just come into power in the Soviet Union. The Solidarity Movement was at its peak. There was enormous sensitivity and ferment throughout the whole communist empire. The 80s were an extraordinary period for international broadcasting, an extraordinary period for Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. We could have considered anybody in the United States. We uh, to the president and said, the man who should chair those radios and guide them at this critical time is Steve Forbes. Having to answer to the government, to the Congress, to the executive branch, to the NSC, to the State Department, which Steve had to do with regularity, at the same time to answer to foreign governments from which it was broadcasting, I am overwhelmed and I am in awe of the leadership qualities that Steve showed on a daily basis. He took it on in a spirit that it was time for him to fulfill his public responsibilities. It was remarkable to see that in a, in a man as young as he was. He's got a will of iron and he knows where he's going and he knows what he wants to get done, but he's able to do it in, in a way that uh, doesn't get people angry, and that's a, it's a great skill. And in the end, when the Berlin Wall came down, all authorities, from Lech Walesa in, in Europe to leaders in the United States, said that the radios had played a pivotal role in ending the Cold War. That is Steve Forbes' legacy as chairman of the U.S. Board for International Broadcasting. What historic years those were in the areas covered by Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and what enormous contributions those radios made under Steve's leadership to the developments that took place. As Pop traveled more, Steve's duties became much more that of the chief operating officer and very often an acting chief executive officer and which made ultimately for the, a very smooth transition even though, though it was sadly very abrupt. And since Steve took over, in fact, the magazine has gone from strength to strength. When my father was alive, we never got beyond being the number two magazine in advertising pages in the United States. And since Steve has taken over, we have been the number one magazine for the past three years. He spent 20 years on the road making speeches and talking to people from in large cities and small towns, in uh, big businesses, we're talking to CEOs and talking to people who are struggling to keep uh, their small family business enterprises uh, afloat and the kind of obstacles and concerns they have. It's also put them in touch with the concerns of America in a far more profound way than somebody who spent the last 20 years inside the Beltway in Washington. Steve has a family of five daughters. They range in ages from seven to, uh, to 22. Uh, so he's got an immediate uh, reality check on what is going on in family uh, in America today. The biggest change in your life comes when you have children. You suddenly realize that there's more to life than what interests you. And while you may look the same physically, or while you may be doing the same job, your outlook on life has changed uh, totally. All Steve's life, he has been thinking about um, what's good for the country. And he's formed very clear ideas about it and very practical ideas about it. Um, the time for those ideas has come. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you someone who I think has a vision that we desperately need to hear in the United States of America, the man who well could be the next president, Steve Forbes. The reason he is pursuing this is to do something, not to be somebody important. It's not just filling a chair, it's what you can do from that office. Steve is a man of convictions. He genuinely believes 
that we've been on the wrong track in some things in our country. And that he has a strong sense of what the right track might be. He has a gift to bring people together, to make people realize we don't have many differences. In fact, we have far more in common. Let us find that common ground. And Steve can find that common ground among all Americans. Steve Forbes is a man with something important to say, and we ought to hear it. The essence of the American dream is allowing individuals the opportunity to discover and develop to the fullest their God-given talents. Just remember, ladies and gentlemen, that seemingly ordinary people can do extraordinary things when they're allowed and encouraged to take responsibility for themselves, their families, and their communities.